Welcome to the FaithBridge Sermon Podcast. Be sure to keep watching immediately after the sermon for Postscript, a weekly podcast with in-depth content and answers to your questions submitted during the sermon. You can also find it on iTunes or at faithbridge.org slash postscript. Well, good morning, and let me say happy Mother's Day, whether you are in Center Court West, Center Court East, if you're up at the Woodlands, or if you're coming to us online, we're so glad that you've chosen to worship at Faith Bridge today. We're going to be in the book of Exodus. That's the second book in the Bible. If you need a Bible, raise your hand. The ushers are coming down the aisle. They'll be glad to give you one that can be yours to keep. If you need it, consider it our gift to you. You can go ahead and turn to Exodus chapter 20. Just put your finger there as a placeholder. We will get to it in the course of the message. But for right now, let's, uh, let's take a moment and pray together. Father, we are so grateful for the privilege and the freedom that we have to gather in your house without fear, without obstruction, to lift up the name of Jesus, to proclaim our faith, to be filled with your Holy Spirit, prepared and equipped to live for you in the world. We pray now that as we turn our attention to your word, your Holy Spirit would come, just as you promised, to be our teacher and to guide us into all truth. We offer our prayer in the strong name of Jesus, amen. Amen. One of the great ironies of life is that some of the things that we cherish the most can also prove to be some of the most challenging things we will ever try to do or deal with. Those things which on the one hand can bring a tremendous amount of fulfillment and satisfaction also have the capacity to push us right to the very limits of our physical, emotional, and mental capacities. And if we were to make a list of these ironies, I'm sure you would agree that somewhere toward the top would be the whole experience of parenting. What is it about these creatures called children that on the one hand can elicit just overwhelming love from us and then seemingly seconds later produce a sense of maddening revulsion? (laughs) As if I don't care if I ever see your face again. What is it about these kids that they can do that? Yeah, parenting, on the one hand, one of the most rewarding things that we will ever do. On the other hand, newsflash, it is hard. And I'm afraid my generation, the baby boomer generation, has made it exponentially harder by introducing the blame game. It's that whole notion that whatever difficulties I have in my life, whatever problems, hang-ups I might happen to have, They are there, you can draw a straight line from those difficulties right back to my relationship with my parents. I mean, it's basically their fault that I have this bad natural hair part. It's their fault that I can't get a date. It's their fault that I'm a pathological lawbreaker. It's their fault, it's their fault, it's their fault. I mean, we expend ourselves, we pour out heart and soul on their behalf. We practically go broke in the process, and what do we get in return? They go on Oprah. Tell the world how we put the fun in dysfunction. (laughs) Now, I mentioned the baby boomer generation because, as Tim Keller points out, my generation, in fact, is the first generation in history to even think in these terms that somehow my problems are my parents' fault. Now, granted, it is an incredibly complex and dynamic and sometimes difficult relationship. But the blame game, yeah, the boomers introduced it, but I think every successive generation thereafter has worked to perfect it. I know some people, their life motto is, hey, if at first you don't succeed, blame your parents. (laughs) Now, we can chuckle about that a little bit, I think, in part because we know there is some measure of truth there. But it has become so much a part of our collective cultural psyche that I thought it would be good for us to take a moment and see what does the Bible have to say about this complicated relationship. 
What's the Bible's perspective on the dynamic between parents and children? We should say from the outset that the Bible does, in fact, recognize it's a powerful relationship. The Bible does not downplay the complexities of that relationship. One of the most startling examples we have of this is when Jesus taught his disciples how to pray. He said, when you pray, say, our Father. The very fact that Jesus would use that parental designation for God tells us something about the power of the parent-child relationship. There's something about that horizontal relationship between parent and child that is meant to teach us something about the vertical, our relationship to God. There's immense power and there's a lot of complexity there. The Bible doesn't play it down, but the Bible does take a slightly different tack a slightly different approach to the relationship than the rather in vogue blame game. Now, the Bible provides for us a a framework, if you will, a structure, a fundamental command that is designed to govern every interaction that we have with our parents. It's found in Exodus chapter 20. I'm sure it is a familiar verse to all of you. Exodus 20, verse 12, one of the Ten Commandments. Honor your father and mother so that you may live long in the land the Lord your God is giving you. Now, on the face of it, that would appear to be a rather straightforward, simple command, right? Well, putting it into practice, you know, that's where things get tricky. Now, granted, there are those of you out there for whom honoring your parents is as easy and natural as breathing. Your parents were godly and diligent and loving, and they took the responsibility seriously. And as a result, your life was blessed. And so now you look back and it's nothing but a joy for you to honor your parents, and rightly so. But there are others in our midst, perhaps more than we realize, for whom this particular verse is one of the most painful passages in the whole Bible. One of the most difficult, certainly, to live out. This was illustrated for me even this week as I was talking to a friend about Mother's Day. And he said to me, Dan, do you know what it's like to go to the card shop go to the Hallmark shop, Mother's Day, and to walk up and down the aisle looking for a card that in some way is going to authentically communicate your feelings. But inevitably, year after year, you wind up leaving empty-handed because there is no card that talks about hurt and anger and pain and betrayal. That was eye-opening for me. I can't say I had ever thought of it in exactly those terms. So recognizing that this is the experience of many in our midst, we have to ask ourselves, does this passage of Scripture apply only to the fortunate few? Is it only for those who can easily, genuinely honor their parents Or is it for everybody? What about the man for whom the word father conjures up memories of being pushed around and even punched from the time that he was just a little guy? What about the woman for whom the word father brings back unspeakable memories? that practically make it impossible for her to have an intimate relationship with her husband? What about the man who remembers walking home from school as a child not knowing which mom would be there? Would it be happy, sober mom? Or would it be the raging, drunk mom? What about the woman 
who had the unpleasable mother, perfectionistic in every way, and nothing was ever good enough. And not once, not even once, did she hear the words, I love you. Does the verse apply to those people as well? I think it does. We have to do a little digging. We have to do a little thinking. We have to do a little talking about this in order to get there. But I think ultimately, yes, God's word applies to all of us, whether our situation has been one of joy or one of pain. The starting place, I think, is for us to define our terms. What do we mean? What does the text mean when it says, honor your father and your mother? Well, in preparation for this message, I read a lot of commentators. I read a lot of smart people. And uh, the definition that I think captures the meaning of the text best of all is this. To honor our parents is a choice of the will, a choice of the will to treat them with dignity and respect, always looking out for their best interests. A choice of the will. Now, I emphasize that phrase, choice of the will, because the fact is we're not always going to feel like it. In fact, some of us may never feel like it. So that begs the question then, well, why? Why should I honor this person? Why should I honor someone who has been so dishonorable? Why should I honor someone who has dishonored me? It's a good question, and it's a question worthy of a good answer. It's really the nub of the issue, isn't it? In fact, I would go so far as to say that this is probably the single most important thing we're going to talk about today, the why of the matter. Because if we have not come to a place of understanding and owning why we should do this, we're probably not going to do it. So why? Should we honor our father and mother even if they have been dishonorable? Here's why. Because honoring mom and dad is more about us than it is about them. It's more about us than it is about them. Now let me flesh that out a little bit. The point of being a Christ follower of being a Christian, a disciple of Jesus Christ, is to be changed, to be completely and irrevocably changed. God is constantly at work in our lives as a follower of Jesus, seeking to change us from the inside out, not just cosmetics, not just externals, but new creatures, Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if any man is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. God's goal in all of this is to make each one of us more and more and more like Jesus. That's why we're being changed into the image of his son. And of course, this isn't a process that happens overnight. It's a lifelong process process in which God is working on us. And a part of the process, a very central part of the process, is learning to trust God when he asks us to do things that our immediate circumstances do not lend themselves to doing. When everything around us says, don't do this, and God says, yes, I want you to do this, it comes down to a matter of choice. Are we going to trust what we can see and feel and touch and hear and taste? Or are we going to put our faith in the God who loves us and take that step? Trusting that even if we can't see the good, somehow he is working the good. Sort of like Jesus, you know. The father said to the son, I want you to go to the cross. 
And all of the visible evidence said quite clearly, no, this would not be a good idea. This would not be a good thing. But Jesus chose to trust the Father, stepped in faith, and good beyond description came of his choice. God never asks us to do anything just because, just because he said so. No, God has a plan and a purpose. God is working something in our lives. And a part of our maturation in Christ is to be able to step back and see the bigger picture and to understand this thing is so much bigger than my immediate situation with my parents. This is about me being equipped for all of eternity. This is about God loving me enough not to let me stay the same. But he chooses to enter into my situation and he beckons me, come, trust me. I know it will hurt. I know it won't be fun, but trust me. We make a choice of the will to treat our parents with dignity and respect, always looking out for their best interests because we genuinely believe that God is working in and through that to change us. That's why we do it. So how do you do it? Well, for starters, not on our own. You and I do not possess the wherewithal to love as we should love. Our love is limited. Our love is finite. Our love remembers wrongs and slights and hurts. Our love is not inclined to forgive. Therefore, if we are going to honor someone who has dishonored us, the starting place is to know and experience the forgiving and unconditional love of Jesus Christ. We can't give away what we don't possess. We must first receive that unconditional forgiving love before we have any chance at all of extending it to someone else. That's exactly why Jesus said in the Gospel of John, as I have loved you, so you must love one another. First, understand, how has he loved me? What has been my experience of the love of Jesus? Have I even had one? Do I know it? Is it central to my life? Is it a motivating factor in my life? We dare not move forward without it. For the Apostle Paul, the love of Jesus was central to his message and ministry. He references it over and over again in his letters. One of the most beautiful, one of the most powerful is found in his letter to the Ephesians, a prayer that he offers on their behalf in chapter three. Listen to this. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people, to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know the love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Friends, when we are filled to the fullness of all the measure of God, we don't have to work up love for somebody else. Our love is the natural overflow of what is already there. That's why we have to begin by knowing and experiencing the unconditional and forgiving love of Jesus. It's that love that will motivate us. It's that love that will carry us even through the challenging moments. Love is the starting place. Where do we go from there? Proceed with caution. And what does that mean? No two situations are the same. No two people are going to honor their parents in exactly the same way because no two people have had exactly the same experience with their parents. 
And a number of factors have to be taken into consideration. Is it safe for me to do this? Are they trustworthy? Am I at a place where I am ready to extend love, understanding that it may not be reciprocated? It may not come back to me. Can I deal with that? All of these things have to be thought of beforehand, before we jump into this sort of thing. Because uh, believe me, folks, I understand, I fully understand that a single sermon is not going to bring anyone to a place where they're ready to just jump up and run out and deal perhaps with years and years of hurt and pain. I get that. Pain makes us leery of snap decisions. But here's the good news. Our God is patient and our God is kind and he will walk with us every step of the way. There won't be a moment that he'll leave us on our own. And as we choose to obey him, he will in fact honor us. How we honor our parents is going to be different for each and every person. And the practical outworking of that experience, um, I like to think of in terms of concentric circles. Our parents there are at the very center. And the degree to which we are prepared to honor them and to be in closer and closer relationship with them will determine how we honor them. For example, those on the outermost ring, this group of people, for them, honoring their parents may mean they just don't want to kill them anymore. <laughs> That's honoring. Seriously, for some people, it, it could be described as not wanting to do harm. And I have known people in my ministry who've been in that hard place, but they've come to a place where, hey, I at least don't want to do them harm, and that's honoring. Coming in a, a, a little bit closer, perhaps honoring our parents means that we don't hate them anymore. We've decided to let that bitterness and that rage, all of that toxicity go. We've had it long enough may not be ready for a relationship, may not even want to communicate with them, but I don't hate them anymore. A little bit closer in, for some people it means I'm finally ready to forgive my parents. I've carried this burden around with me long enough. I'm ready to lay it down. And maybe we'll establish a relationship and maybe we won't, but the important thing is we've walked in obedience and we have forgiven even as we have been forgiven. And then there, closest to the middle, are those who by God's grace and his mercy are at a place where they are able to say, I'm ready to reconcile. I've worked through my feelings and my hurt and my pain and I have forgiven and I'm ready to reestablish a relationship and move forward. How we honor our parents depends on where we are on the spectrum. Someone asked me, well, how do you move closer and closer to the middle? How do you get to the middle? And let me hasten to say that's not necessarily the goal. It's not the goal for everybody to get right smack to the middle, to reestablish a relationship. Perhaps you say, well, why not? I mean... Shouldn't that, isn't that a worthy goal? Well, for some, yes, but for others, it's simply not possible. For one thing, parents may no longer be living. In other situations, it is simply not safe or wise to do so. So where is the place that all of us should be working toward? I would say it is the place of forgiveness. That's what we've been commanded to do is to forgive. Forgive. And whether we ever get past that and actually reestablish a relationship, well, 
You know, that's up to you and the Lord. But the place I think where we all need to land is at the place of forgiveness. I don't know where you are on the chart. Maybe you're not up there at all. That's between you and the Lord. But here's the point. It's going to be different for every single person. And there's no stopwatch. It's not as if anybody gets a prize for being healed of their pain first. No, God is patient, God is kind, and he's going to walk with us every step of the way as we walk in faith. Now, there's one more aspect of honoring our parents that we need to talk about, and that's a situation where the shoe is on the other foot where it is not the parent who has caused the pain, but rather the child. Because you see, it's not just parents who are capable of damaging a relationship. Children are more than capable of bringing pain and hurt into a family's life. And perhaps the reason God has you here today is to stop and consider you know, maybe the way for me to honor my mom and dad is for me to take responsibility, for me to step forward and say, I'm sorry, please forgive me. In the years uh, between college and seminary, there was about a, a six-month stretch there where I lived with my parents. I moved back in right after college just to get my feet under me. And I look back on that six-month period with more embarrassment and regret than I can communicate. Because during that time period, I was thoughtless, rude, selfish, presumptuous, unkind. I was not good to my mother and father. It is a wonder they did not just toss me out right on my ear. It was at a time when my, uh, my depression was coming on full force, and uh, I, I did not know that at the time. Uh, but even if I had known it, there was no excuse, no excuse whatsoever for the way that I was behaving. It was unconscionable. One day, my mom and I were in the kitchen together. <laughs> I was standing at the sink, and she was right behind me at the stove, and I was looking out the window into the backyard. And in a flash, just in, in a single moment, it's though the scales dropped from my eyes, and I could see myself clearly. I could see the insufferable jerk that I had been toward my parents for no good reason. And I'm convinced it was the work of the Holy Spirit because the conviction fell on me like a ton of bricks and I began to weep. I began to sob almost uncontrollably and my poor mom, bless her heart, she's standing there, has no idea what's going on in my head. She just knows that one minute we're there and the next I am a bawling mess. And it took about three or four minutes before I could regain my composure and say to her, Mom, I am so, so sorry. There's no excuse. Please forgive me. And by God's grace, she did. Honoring our parents means different things for different people, and maybe the best way you can honor your parents today is to go to them and say, you know what? I can see. I wasn't perfect in this relationship either. Please forgive me. Well, we've talked about some hard things today, but I don't make any apologies for that because uh, we've talked about real things. Real people real life. You know, that's where Jesus lives, with real people in real life. The Bible says that we are to rejoice with those who rejoice and to weep with those 
who weep. And if you're here today and honoring your parents is a joy and a privilege and something that you look forward to and appreciate, then I rejoice with you. I, I, I count myself in your number and I give thanks to God that that blessing and that privilege is yours. But if you're here today and honoring your parents is more a matter of weeping than rejoicing, I want you to know that I weep with you. But more important than that, Jesus weeps with you. And he doesn't stop there. Jesus isn't just about weeping. No, Jesus is about redeeming. Jesus is all about redemption. Because of the cross, because of his victory over sin, because of his resurrection from the dead, Jesus has given to us the sure and certain hope of redemption, that things aren't going to stay the way they are, that we're going to be changed, that this world is going to be changed, and that his good and perfect will is going to be brought to bear on all of our lives. That's what Jesus wants to do for you. That's what Jesus is doing for you. And my prayer and my hope for those of you who weep today is that the tears of pain can be replaced one day with tears of joy as you step into the fullness of the redemption we find only in Jesus. Would you pray with me, please? Father, we come before you this morning confessing that we need you so desperately. Whether it is to forgive or to be forgiven, we cannot do it on our own. Our flesh wars against us. And so give to us today your grace, your mercy, your humility, and empower us to be men and women who are being shaped and molded to the image of Jesus, willing to take steps of obedience even when it seems foolish, willing to humble ourselves and seek forgiveness. Thank you for loving us every step of the way and thank you for never abandoning us. We pray, oh God, for an outpouring of that grace. In Jesus' name, amen. Welcome to Postscript. Here we hope to answer your questions and help you dig deeper into the messages and sermons at FaithBridge by talking with the teacher of the day. Hi, and welcome to Postscript. I'm Lou Ann Riley, Grow Group and Discipleship Director here at FaithBridge, and I'm here with Pastor Dan, who just talked about honoring your father and mother here at Mother's Day at Faith Bridge. Welcome, Pastor Dan. Thanks. How are you today? I'm good, thank Such you. Such a pleasure to have you back here with us at Postscript. And love that you talked about um, here on Mother's Day, this command that we have of honoring your father and mother. Mm -hmm. um, I have a question um, okay. as we kind of looked at this. Um, when we talk about honoring our parents, we know that there's other scriptures where it talks about obeying right. your parents. What is the difference in the scriptures when it talks about honoring your parents versus obeying your parents? Sure. Well, um, to obey our parents is something we do during our childhood. Okay. Uh, two times in the New Testament, in Ephesians and in Colossians, Paul tells us, obey your parents. But both commands are directed specifically to children. So obedience is for the childhood years, but we honor our parents uh, all of our lives, their lives, uh, it, it's something we never stop, stop doing. We grow out of the obedience, but we maintain the honor. Okay, good, good. Okay, so here's another question that came in. Um, one of the things um, that someone wrote in as listening to your sermon is uh, how we treat our parents. Um, can that be how we are treated by our, our children? Is there a correlation between that? Well, I would say there is not a necessary correlation there. I, I, I suppose if, 
if someone treats their parents a certain way and does not change or grow in any way and then teaches their children, this is how you may treat me, yeah, I suppose that would work out. But it does not automatically follow that's how it will work. Um, our children will treat us the way that we teach them to treat us. Mm -hmm. And we can either uh, grow out of um, bad ways that we treated our parents or we can maintain good ways that we treated our parents. So it's kind of up to us, mm -hmm. really. Okay, that's good. Um, and then another question that came around um, is you talked about how we, we can't in our own imperfect flesh love in the fullness in the way that Christ does. Mm -hmm. We cannot offer something that we don't have right. ourselves. And so how do we experience this love, this fullness? How do we know that we have that love okay. of Christ? Sure. Well, I think there are several ways that we can know and be sure of Christ's love for us. Uh, there is the objective side of the equation and the, and the subjective side. On the objective side, uh, we know that we are loved by Christ uh, by virtue of what He did for us on the cross. So there's that fact. Then Paul tells us also that when we enter into a relationship with Christ, His love is shed abroad in our hearts, so He imparts to us specifically the gift of love. So those are truths that we can stand upon whether we're actually feeling them or not. But I suspect the questioner really is getting at more the subjective side. How do you know that you are loved by Jesus? Well, um, I think it is the same as it is in any other relationship. The more one cultivates a relationship where both parties are interested in being loving toward one another, both parties begin to experience that love. It's not something that you just turn on like you turn on a, a switch, uh, but with the passage of time and intentionality and a focus on, on loving each other, being as loving as we can toward Jesus and giving Him opportunity to love us, I think He reveals that to us in a number of ways. I think He reveals that to us through His body the church. Mm -hmm. I think He reveals that to us through His provision for our lives. I think He reveals that to us through the spiritual nourishment we get through His Word and through prayer. And on occasion, when He chooses to, He imparts to us feelings of love. But there again, that's not something we can just work up or, or should even try to work up. Uh, he imparts gifts to us as He sees fit. And so, my suggestion would be more to focus on the relationship than on somehow uh, trying to secure feelings of love. Does that make sense? It does. It does. It's a good explanation of both the objective sort of and the subjective love of Christ. I know whenever relationships are difficult, sometimes it's just doing the next. You act your way into <laughs> certain feelings. You do. That's right. Yeah. You do. Sure do. Um, well, thank you for mm -hmm. this message. Um, and sometimes it can be hard, but obviously there's some people today who can rejoice, as you said, yeah. with theirs, but then also maybe have some difficult things to do as well. So thank you for you your message. And thank you for joining us here for Postscript. We'll see you back here next week. Thanks for joining us for Postscript. Help us keep the podcast interactive by submitting your questions during the morning services. Learn more at faithbridge.org slash postscript.